things today. Jesus' birth, holy night, shepherds. Why am I doing this series? Well, a lot of times we get caught up in the circumstance of Santa Claus. We don't know the background of what happened with the actual birth, and we don't understand that birth was actually designated just for the cross. Now remember, before he made the world, before he made the universe, he had already decided how he was going to do this. But he had to find a vessel. Today we're going to learn about why it took place, how it took place, and why these three things are so important. Now, I don't do con con traditional Christmas stuff. Uh, being the atheist that I used to be, I wanted to make sure you guys got the behind the scenes because what do you do when somebody asks you why is Christmas so important? It's a pagan holiday. What's your response? You're correct. It is a pagan holiday. Christmas trees are pagan. Okay, but then you got to be able to expand on that. It's kind of like Easter. Why is Pentecost so important 50 days after Easter? We've got to know the behind the scenes because what's our number one job? Heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. If we can't preach the gospel, being an atheist like I was and a smart one, I knew more about the Bible than the people that were trying to teach me about Christ. It's our turn to know more about the Bible and everything that goes with it more than the atheists that are trying to trick us. And that's what I want to do for you guys today. All right, go ahead and turn to Luke 2. Today I'm going to use King James. Uh, if you look at the various versions, I think I've got 36 versions on my, my phone. Uh, the King James is the only one that has all the verbiage uh, for Christmas. Actually, it's the only one that has all the verbiage for every passage. Uh, even though it's translated from Greek and Hebrew, it's the closest we have. So everybody remember what's so significant about Luke versus the other three. Luke interviewed Mary before she died. And he got to sit down with her endlessly and talk about the birth, what took place, everything that was surrounding it. But there's going to be something unique about Matthew that Matthew has something that the other three don't have about the birth. Uh, I'll talk about that next week. But today is just about these three things on the board. All right, so who in here has been to Israel? But you don't count. Lion doesn't count. He lives here. All right, and nobody else. Okay. If you go to Israel right now, the church of the nativity is over the birthplace of Christ. And I'm going to give you some historical facts so you'll have them. Uh, sixth century, uh, Emperor Justinian actually put a church over that birthplace. Now, nothing looks like it did when Jesus was born from the cave he was in to where he was born. Uh, and Lion can tell you how ornate it is now because they've actually refurbished that place seven or eight times in 1,500 years. Now, they have to get permission to do it, but it looks amazing now. So you can go on the uh, Internet and look up what it looks like, Christ's birthplace. It didn't look like that when he was born. All right, and then if you go to 326 to 328, um, the empress or the emperor's mother, Helena, actually redecorated it again. That was uh, Constantine's mom. The reason we have so much historical data about Jesus' birth is because of her. She went back and interviewed or coerced or put pressure on, whichever you want to call the interviews. They decided that it was advantageous to give her as much information as they could. So she interviewed descendants of everybody that was there during his birth or during his ministry, and then she pieced all this together. And then if you look back, Justin Martyr actually wrote extensively on this uh, in the second century. Now, if you look him up on the Internet, it'll say he was martyred. All right, so look him up, uh, write that down, Justin Martyr, uh, and go do some research on who Justin Martyr was, okay? All right, so now let's start at 2, and we're in Luke. And it came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world shall be taxed. Now remember, when a decree came down, it had to be approved by the Senate. The Senate had to approve this decree before it went out. Sound familiar? Yeah, it looks a lot like our system now today. So they issued this. Now, why would they issue the decree? Why do we do census in the United States? One reason, one reason only. Dollar bills. They want to know what tax revenue is going to be an availability to come in. They got to do the budget. So they issue a decree for everybody to come back to be taxed or surveyed. They got to know how many people we have. They got to know how many dollar bills are coming in. Or, or the government can't run. And to think we thought that came up with us. And they had to know how many population were where. All right, so, so the government runs on forecasted budgets. Sounds like, a, like it does now, right? Now, we run on forecasted debt. 
but they were running on forecasted budget at the time. Now, Cyrenius was the, the governor at the time. What people don't realize is he served twice. If you look in other translations, Cyrenius is not listed. That's why I'm using the, 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 new, uh, the uh, King James Version. He was actually twice governor. Because if you look at New Living Translation or something else, it lists a different governor. So you want to make the distinction between that. So the decree went out to all the world. Now, did the decree really go to all the world? No, it went to the Roman Empire. They didn't have the power to tax him at one part of the Roman Empire. But if you ask a Roman, were they in charge of the whole world? Yeah, yeah. They thought they controlled everything. All right, so let's keep going. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and went out to be taxed everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth in Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. A uh, pretty good lineage to be, right? Also forecasted who would be born in the lineage of David? Jesus. All right, so now you've got Caesar deciding he's going to tax the whole world. Now, a caveat to this, who in here is a literature uh, fan? <laughs> Y'all notice that every Roman always had a British accent? Actually, every actor in every movie, whether it's from Japan or Afghanistan, always talks like they're from Britain. Isn't that amazing? Or Richard Burton. Everybody sounds like Richard Burton. All right, so... Caesar Augustus was really named Octavian. If you look back at your literature class, and poor Cheyenne's going to have to go through this very soon, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, everybody's familiar with that, right? And Richard Burton and Liz Taylor played in that movie, right? Octavian was the one that killed him. And if you remember your history, it was Octavian Mark Anthony who sided up to handle everybody else, the conspirators, and he rubbed out his two co-conspirators uh, and handled that and took over everything. All right, just a little caveat to know who Jesus is dealing with at the time. All right, so let's keep going. All right, all means all means all, right? Every single person is going to have to be taxed. There are no exceptions. There are no exclusions. You must go. If you know anything about the Roman Empire, are, is that an empire you really want to disobey? No. no, they had a way of convincing you it was probably in your best interest to do what they told you to do. Now, the cool thing is, and this is a little caveat to everything, God will inconvenience the entire world to get his job done. He didn't just do it for Joseph and Mary or for Jesus. He'll do it for you. Nice little thing to know that he really loves you. And if he gives you a job to do, he's going to get this job done. And he's going to give you the people to do it, the resources to do it. So take something from this other than the fact that Jesus was born. But God's on your side, too. All right. So here's what happened. Imagine every single person in the entire country having to go to their places of birth simultaneously. Who in here is being in a hurricane evacuation? Is it just me? Uh, two of us. I used to live in Raleigh. It seems like as soon as I lived, moved to Raleigh, a hurricane hit every year. And a huge one hit the first year I was there. Every single person from eastern North Carolina had to come up I-40 or Highway 64. Can you imagine what that was like? And then every hotel in Raleigh, Chapel Hill, Burlington, Greensboro, Winston-Salem was all full of people. All right, so now try doing that with no cars. Every single school, every single business, every single person had to pack a bag simultaneously and get ready to, for a trip to the empire all at the same time. Who, who's been over the Mideast? Seen all the rocks and the roads and the dirt and everything that's stirred up. Who in here has seen John Wick? Okay, all right, if you've seen John Wick, you've seen the conditions of what they had to travel in, right? All right, so every single person is required to go back. Now, if you were an innkeeper, if you were a shopkeeper, if you had a restaurant, th this is high time, man. Every single person's got to be back in your facility simultaneously. There's one catch there. What happens if you can't drive as fast as everybody else? So you might showed up at a hotel and they swear you never made a reservation. Yeah. If you travel for business, it happens. And then they swear they've never heard from you. You don't have a reservation, and they're full. So imagine being Mary and Joseph, nine months pregnant, every single person in the world traveling with you, and you can travel half as fast as everybody else. All right, so what would have been a four-day trip turns into seven to ten. They say it was probably ten. Now imagine going, has anybody been over, who's been over there besides Lion, anybody? Who's been in the North Georgia Mountains? 
Is it fun? Who spin the stone mountain? All right. How much fun is it to, to run up that hill? Am I the only person that ran up it? Just to see if I could do it and then I almost collapsed when I got on top. And then realized I was too old to do it. Yeah, that was just stupid. But I made it. Uh, then I took the thing back down. I didn't, I didn't walk. Uh, so imagine going, you're pregnant, you're nine months pregnant. How many women in here have given birth? How many people wanted to go up a hill no. uh, on, a, on a mule no. with rocks? <laughs> and who was happy, period, just being pregnant? No. Yeah, and it's really hot and you're not having a whole lot of fun doing it. And then you get to take it out on your husband and you have to camp overnight and you have to slip on the hard ground with rocks. No. Yeah, okay, so the hill's like this. For seven to ten days, all you can do is ride on a mule, stop for the bathroom. Not like you have to go to the bathroom a lot, right? Like yeah, every five seconds. So you have to get off the mule. Poor Joseph. He had no idea what was coming. They never told him, the angels never told him, you're going to take a ten-day journey with a pregnant woman that's about to give birth, and it's going to be joyous. But... He had to get him to a specific spot, right? Because the prophecy had to be fulfilled. He had to be born in Bethlehem. So he inconvenienced the world to get everybody there. Now, the elevation was difficult. Let me read directly from my notes. It's 70 to 90 miles, depending on which route you took, of rocky roads. Were those roads safe at the time? No. Bandits everywhere. Or it was the wild, wild west. Normally four-day journey, not this time. Then you have to stop and camp. Now, when you get that Bethlehem, write this down in your notes. The meaning of Bethlehem is the house of bread. Why is this important? Because if you write this scripture down, John 6, 41. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He's the bread of life. There aren't any accidents in heaven. There aren't any exceptions in heaven. Every single thing that God did was meticulously designed before this universe was ever created. All right, and because of my wife's chad, chiding, I will be doing the creation of the universe probably in January. If you're at home, I'm looking over at my wife to get the go-ahead. But uh, um, my wife and the Holy Spirit seem like the same people. All right, so Luke 5 and 6. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And it so was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. I don't even like to travel on horseback anymore because it hurt my back. I can't imagine being nine months pregnant, ready to give birth, because if you'll notice, she gives birth as soon as she gets there. I don't know what it's like to be pregnant. Praise God. I praise God every single day that I'm a man, and I cannot give birth. It's a joyous occasion to be a man. But imagine being her. She's got the promise. They never tell you. Does God ever tell you what you're going to go through when you say yes to his promise? No. No. Would anybody take the deal if he told you up front what you had to go through? No, that's not the deal, though. He didn't tell you the end. If Mary knew the end, would she have signed up for it? No. She's not going to watch her child be beaten to death and then crucified. She would have tried to hide him. She would have tried to derail the entire thing, not knowing what she was going to do. All right, so now we've got the journey. We've got there. Now, does anybody remember how many siblings Jesus had? Okay, go to Matthew 13, 55, write that down, and I'll go over it again. There were at least two sisters, at least two sisters, and four brothers. Joseph, Jude, Simeon, and James were the brothers. Caveat, if you're at home, it's just a caveat, but it's nice information to have. All right, so let's go to 2-7. Two, uh, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Let's think about this. Why was there no room? Now, remember, this is not like a, a Days Inn or a, a, a Ritz or um, even a, a, a B&B would probably be closer. It were people that roomed out spare, were, rented out spare rooms in their homes. It's not like they had hotels or Holiday Inn. So by the time everybody got there in four days and you get there in seven to ten, there's nowhere else to go. Now, has anybody seen the meme where Mary's chiding him the whole way up the mountain? I don't understand. My mom told me not to marry you, and I don't know why you couldn't have made reservations. And, and is that true? Am I the only husband who hears that? Uh, my wife has never said that about mom, though. Uh, her mom did tell her not to marry me, and she married me anyway. All right, so now let's look at this. And we'll go over this with the shepherds. They get there late. There's one place left 
But the one place left was not an accident, was it? Why was he going to have to be born in a cave-like structure, specifically that type of structure, with specifically the things that were going on around him? For one, it had to fulfill Scripture. But what else? God never does anything without type and shadow, right? He always wants to know what the coming event is before it takes place. He's going to tell you ahead of time what's going to take place, much like Jesus did with parables. So he gets to the manger or the cave, whatever you want to call it nowadays. And the funny thing is, if you ask Lion, it doesn't look like that now, right? At all. If you're at home, one of our missionaries is here and he lives in Israel. Um, the structure you would see, you would have to go out. There's some of the, the original structures that are still left there. If you go out from the city, you can see some of the structures that are original. They've, they've kept them the way they look. But if you look at where Jesus was born now, it's not even close. The walls are decorated and painted with beautiful mosaics. You name it, it's been done. But the original structure was a cave-like structure. Who, who slept in caves? What else? What else? You guys are giving me critters. Shepherds. And the answer is the shepherds. Uh, David. King David. Now... They wrapped him in swaddling clothing because he is who again? The Lamb of God. Swaddling clothing. Does everybody know what that is? Those are pieces of material that you wrap around a lamb when the lamb's born and a baby to protect them. Now, me growing in an agricultural society, I actually got that part of the story. I knew what you did to the lambs when they were born. Uh, we had a friend of ours that raised them uh, when I was a kid, and I would go over and see what they did with all the lambs. So he's being introduced as the Lamb of God or the Lamb of the world who's come on the scene. Now, did anybody really get that at the time? No. Like disciples, did they ever get what he was talking about till he was gone? No. Do we get what our mentors are trying to tell us before they're gone? Every time, so we graduate from college, and then 10 years later, we get it. Or, as parents, who in here said, who in here's finally said, because I said so? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We, we got why our parents said that, right? I don't have time to explain to you what's going on. God, there's so much with this, and I want you to write these two scriptures down. John 129 and 136. Those two scriptures are introducing Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Lamb that will take the sin of the world away. Okay, so make sure you make a notation of that. So he's wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. All right, manger. Who in here was raised on a farm besides me? Uh, okay, Warren's going to do this because he was raised in Virginia. And Virginia farms are absolutely beautiful. I would assume yours was, right? Uh, if you've never been to Virginia at home, uh, I think Virginia countryside is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Uh, me growing up in North Carolina, I spent a lot of time in Virginia. Now, a trough or, is a place where you feed horses, cows, pigs, uh, any animal on a farm. That's what they laid him at. That was what was termed as a manger. Now, the cool thing is, if you go to Israel today, you, it's still there, right? Uh, it's made out of stone, and that, it is still there. You can see where they laid him as a baby. So it's still there if you want to see the original. Now remember, when you go, it's been commercialized. But you can still go up to the church. So you can w actually walk up to the church in nativity and walk down a flight of stairs and go down and see it. Uh, so it's really cool. Anybody plan on going to Israel? All right, yeah, we are. Anybody else going? Have you, have you been? No. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing what you see. Now, two wait. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. So we know the shepherds are close by. Now I'm going to go over what they were doing at the time, but I'm going to go over the holy night first. So now we've got the scene. We get to a cave. She's very unhappy. She's in the process of giving birth before they get her sat down. She's probably laying on a whole mixture of hay. Uh, growing up like we did, we played in all the barns. We actually made uh, slides out of hay. Because you got a three-story barn, so you got to get down quickly. So we made hay slides, like water slides. Uh, so uh, am I the only person who grew up like uh, Warren did? Did you make hay slides? Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. So now 
we know what's going on. Now, Holy Night, who sang that in church before? Yeah, all of us had. But why do we sing Silent Night? Silent Night, Holy Night, nothing but silent. It would, there was no silence in this place. Who else was in this place with the baby and with Joseph and with Mary? The entire section of animals. So you imagine, there's cows, pigs, no, no, no pigs. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the United States. My bad. No pigs, no pigs. Uh, that's me. I like barbecue and I like bacon, so I throw that in the story. Um, every animal that you could see even in a field. A whole bunch of other people that didn't get reservations on time at Holiday Inn. They're drinking, they're dancing around. There's nothing holy about these, the night for these people. They're there to do a job, pay their tax, get out of town. And then there's Mary giving birth. We don't know if anybody else was giving birth in the cave that night. We do know that they were there. And it was anything but quiet. So what was it like giving birth quietly? Can you imagine people hollering and screaming and drinking and standing and watching? Who in here had their, their significant other with them when they gave birth? I had a lot of people. <laughs> I don't know if it was still vogue when, when, when we started. Uh, they st that's a new thing, right? Mom, was that allowed then? Because I remember my dad was not allowed in to the, he was stuck out in the weight room. Yeah. All right. So it was within our, so it was baby boomer after, right? So, okay. So now Joseph's standing there. He's having to deliver the baby. Not like he had any help. And then he's got all these drunk people around him watching. Who in here wants to endure that? Because when we talk about Mary, we don't give her a lot enough credit for sitting there while, hey, y'all man, I'm backing off. All right, so let's look at this. So it's a holy night. It's holy because of who showed up. There you go, Amy. Who is that go, Amy? I am. If I watch the Ten Commandments, it's going to be on. It's Christmas time. Charlton Heston's going to get out the stick. Then Ben Hur is going to show up, and it's going to be the same guy. It's not like Rio Bravo or uh, El Dorado. All right, so I am. Why is this so significant? I am just showing up. You'll see this twice in literature. You'll see this in the Old Testament. He's talking to Moses. I am. I'm Ego Amy. You're going to see it when he's arrested in the garden. I am, and every single soldier, all 600 Roman soldiers, are glued to the floor and they can't get up. That's when Peter sprang into action. But the power of both those incidents, there's a reason why you can't wear your shoes. You're on holy ground. So I am decided to come. That's why it's holy. He just changed the trajectory of our lives and he planned that before it all started. So what's the difference? Can he come as God? Why can he not come as God? What took place that prohibited God from coming to earth to save us? Stop answering questions over there. If you're at home, my missionary won't be quiet and let anybody else answer. But he's doing a great job. But he's doing a great job. But he needs to be quiet. Show off, grade grubber. Adam and Eve, like he blurted out, committed treason. Once rulership is handed over to Lucifer, by law, only a man can take it away from him. So the son of man, the second Adam, had to come and take it away from him. And he had to come in human form. If he's not in human form, it's a no-go, and he cannot be sacrificed to the cross, and he cannot take back over, and he can't give us pre-Adam status, and he cannot give us Genesis 126 back. And then Revelation 118 doesn't apply. All right, so Revelation 118, he overcame what? What was our one enemy? Death. Death and sin. He overcame death that day through the cross, and then Revelation 118 kicks back in, and now we're pre-fall status, and now we get to be back. All right, none of that takes place if he does not come in human form. So you can imagine what he had to go through to decide to come through the birth canal that he developed through a woman 
and then come to earth, give up every single pre-existing right that he had, and live just like we did. Who in there thinks they could do that? That's love, brother, because I don't think I could do it either. All right, so morphe is what it's called. It's, it's Greek for form. Jesus already existed, not just as a component of God. Jesus was, in fact, God and existed in the form of God before he was revealed to us as man. God had to come here, look like us, act like us, smell like us, taste like us, had to do everything the same way we did, and then had to go through every single temptation that we would ever face to be able to go to that cross. A lot of times we gloss over and still act like he was God. He forfeited the right to be the creator for 33 years. He could not access that power except through the power of the Holy Spirit at any time. So many times we make this story out to be something that's not true. We still act like he was God. He was not. Or this doesn't take and Lucifer can cry foul. And then he goes over to Luke 18 and takes God to court and he wins. All right, so that's why this is so important. His glory was so powerful that it could not come in human flesh. If you go online and look up people that have been to heaven, they have to eat this fruit substance to be in God's presence or your, your flesh will dissolve. Remember, photon light will dissolve you. We're made out of photon light. We're made in His image and pure energy will dissolve you. Who's seen what a nuclear blast can do? That's what God would do to you. Who saw Indiana Jones, the first one? Remember when they opened the ark and their faces melt? That's what would happen to us in the presence of God. We cannot sustain that much energy or power. So he had to, to, to leave that, clothe himself in a new form to appear to us. So he had to shed every single piece of glory and splendor that he had to be in our presence. Who was here spin to a plan, a nuclear plan or anything and felt the presence? Or been by a power pole and could hear the popping of the power? And then your hair starts to stand up. Or... Van de Graaff generator when you stick your hand on it with the wand. Uh, some of us don't have hair to stand up, but if you do have hair to stand up, you know what it means. Sorry, Jonathan. I wasn't thinking about you. <laughs> All right. So the Creator works in the created world. He became material, clothes himself in human flesh, form of a servant who does the bidding for the owner. The entire decision was based on when I come here in my human form, I'm going to do everything the Father in heaven tells me to do. Is that a pretty good formula to follow? What happens if he deviates one bit? Deal's off. Then we go to hell. So the deal's still on, and then he gave it all up, and he had to assist the master to do what he told him to do. Now, if you look back in the old Greek, uh, if you look some back at the Hebrew stories, schema. Anybody ever read the story of the emperor who decided he wanted to be close to his people? But he couldn't go out in his regal robes and with his guards because everybody would bow down and serve him. So he snuck out of the back of the palace one day, put on their clothes, and went and walked the streets all day. No security, just became one of them because he wanted to see what their lives were like and he didn't have access to that. That's what our Savior did. He could not have access if he didn't look and smell like us. Did anybody realize who he was while he was here? Outside of the elements. Still not listening to you. I'm looking over here or over here. <laughs> Mary did because Gabriel told her who he was. But outside of that, did anybody really get who he was? No. How could they? He looked too much like us. He sounded like us. He went through what we did. He had to depend completely on the Holy Spirit. He didn't have any advantages that we don't have this day. But we don't have those advantages if he didn't show up, live out those advantages and go to the cross, right? All right, so he wanted to be in the likeness of men, the womb of a virgin. Now what happens? As soon as the angel proclaims what's going to happen, the angel comes and meshes with Mary's body. And now that, that little baby's placed in that womb. Instantaneously when it happened. And then by the time she sees Elizabeth, John the Baptist jumps in the womb at the announcement of this baby being born, foreshadowing when he would baptize this baby and the Holy Spirit would come on him. A lot of people don't realize that John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. All right. Hebrews 4.15, write this down. I'm having to speed through this today for time. Actually, turn through Hebrews 4.15. People always ask me all the time, why did Jesus have to do this or that? Or why did he have to experience what we did? You're getting ready to see. Everybody ready? All right. 
For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. Come boldly. That's why we can always go boldly to the throne to talk to God because we have been redeemed. We are the righteousness of Christ and we're seated at the right hand of the Father. He's not faced anything that you haven't faced and you ain't faced anything that he didn't. He didn't fail. Who failed? Adam. Adam failed the first test. The first big test. So why didn't Jesus fail? He never lost sight of what his job was. If you don't lose sight of what your job is, can you do that? Yeah. All right, so what is Christmas really about? It ain't about a baby. Death on the cross. That's the Christmas story. You have to be born to get to the finish line. You have to start to finish. We spend too much time talking about glossed over stuff in church and not about the, the most important thing that ever happened. Death on the cross and the resurrection. Three days changed all of history. And those three days were changed before we were created or before the universe was created. All right, so now let's go to Luke 8, and we're going to start with, uh, with the shepherds, etc., etc. All right, everybody ready? Actually, yeah, let's go Luke. Luke 2. Is that what I said? You said 8. Sorry. I don't have Sarah to clear that up on the internet for me right now. Sarah, I, I think I confuse Sarah sometimes when I'm filming. Wrong scripture. All right, now we're back to where we're supposed to be. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, you like that? And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were afraid. All right, so imagine being in a pitch black field. Now, what's their job? Their job, they work for the temple. They have to guard all the sacrificial lambs. Lambs have to be blemish-free, and nothing can happen to them. So it's a very important job, and they only had the best shepherds doing this. And you kept a vigil. You didn't go to sleep. You didn't mess around. You did your job. You made sure everything was handled. No wolves out there. No people stealing the lambs. Nothing. No funny business. That was your job 24-7. You did not screw this up. So imagine all of a sudden a spotlight over your head and then an angel showing up on the scene. Who ever seen an angel? I always like to say I married one, but that's not, that's not exactly a biblical one. Um, if you're at home, I have to have brownie points throughout the sermon. It helps when I get out of here. All right, so they're taking care of sacrificial lambs. Now, here's the thing. The shepherds are standing there looking at lambs who are going to be sacrificed. The angel comes low. Is that really how that happened? You're shepherds. You've never seen anything. You kind of believe in witchcraft. You're not really sure about anything. And then a spotlight appears over your head. And then this being standing in front of you. What's your first instinct to do? Run. When we were kids, if we got scared in the woods or our flashlight went out, what did we normally do? Run. So what's the next thing he says? Hey, 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 hey. Don't be afraid. Don't run. How far do you think they ran before he caught them? Well, since he's like this fast, they run and he's still standing in front of them. Who in here would not be afraid if that happened to you? Happened to you now. All of a sudden there's a light over your head and there's no light anywhere else. It's just on you. Anybody been in this theater where the spotlight's just on you? And now an angel being you've never seen has shown up to tell you what's going on right over here. And lo, the angel Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And there shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And then suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill towards men. A lot in this verse. Low means wow. Can you believe this is happening right now? Now what's so significant? Why are all the heavenly hosts there to see what's going on? They had never seen God. 
This was the first time in the history of, of being that they would finally get to see what God looked like. Even the angels can't see His face in heaven. So now, every single angelic host showed up for this birth. Was there any chance of anybody getting in here to sabotage it? No. No, you got Michael and Gabriel leading the charge. You've got all these angels, nothing's getting by. Who did want to sabotage it? Yeah. Now, he was going to use Herod to do that, but Herod ended up screwing it up anyway, right? All right, so we'll go over that next week. But if we look at it this way, Savior of the world, it means healer, redeemer, righteous one. He's going to be the one that sets the record straight. He's the only one that can set the record straight. So who were the first people to find out what Jesus' job was? Shepherds. The angel told them in detail what Jesus' job was. Because they're watching over who again? The lambs that go to slaughter. What were those lambs in place of? Them. It had to cancel out the sin, right? So now the bigger lamb, the most important one, is going to cancel out sin too. And they were the first ones to find out what Jesus' job was. Do you think this changed their lives forever? Yeah, they were there at his birth. Can you imagine them going to heaven when they got there and the rejoicing that was happening when they got there? All right, so now we've got, we always think of lowly shepherds. Were these lowly shepherds? No. No, these were the special forces of shepherds, I guess. All right? These guys were the best of the best of the best of the best. They've just been told, you're watching the wrong lambs. Now, what's the penalty for losing, leaving their post to go look for something? Probably so. And remember, in that society, was it just death for you? Oh, no, it was your whole bloodline. So, big deal, but the angel goes, the Lamb of God's being born over here, and I need you guys to go over there. Leaving their post to go over and find the other one. Now, why do they have to tell them what Jesus looked like? Remember, this is a cave full of people, and it's not the only cave. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. Do they know a little something about swaddling clothes? Yeah, the other one's wrapping the lambs. You distinctly will know him. So they had to go from cave to cave to cave to cave to find him. But when you see the one wrapped in swaddling clothes, you'll know it's him. That also tells us maybe he's not the only baby in the caves. And they had to search and search and search. Who's watching the sheep while they're gone? They just left their post to go look for a baby, not knowing how long they'd be gone, not knowing where he was, but it was so important they went and did it. If an angel came and told you to do something, would you do it? Believe it or not, some people would not. But yes, so the Messiah, the Anointed One, is there waiting on them to find him. So what do we know about shepherds? They were the world's first evangelists. First evangelists, why? They went and told everybody. But who really believed them? Hey man, you'd never believe who's showing up tonight and we got to go guard him and we got to go talk. Now, why is it that we have all this on a greeting card for Hallmark? Do they get that right? No. 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 They wanted to sell greeting cards. Do people in living nativities normally get this right? No. no. Why not? We've been taught that everybody was there in one spot at the same time simultaneously, which allows an atheist to shoot holes in the story. I know that because I was the atheist shooting holes in the story. Because I can mathematically prove why this wasn't true if you told it the, the real way. Because mathematically, it's impossible for everybody to be there simultaneously. Also, we know that the shepherds had to be nearby to be able to find him. Uh, if you ever want to go over there, that would be the thing to look up. Uh, and they have tour guides, correct? Um, and they speak English, right? And most of them speak English. If that, they have earpieces to do translation. All right, so now let's go to 14. And glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill to men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them in heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad, saying, 
which was told to them concerning this child. And, with, and all they had heard, it wondered those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they were heard and seen. It was told unto them. Now, go back to Mary pondered this in her heart. When do you think she took the pondering and made it verbal? Did I stomp the, the, uh, the, uh, the know-it-all over here? Okay, you can speak now. When was it made known? To Luke. She had pondered and pondered and reviewed all these things. She kept this a secret in her heart till Luke interviewed her, and then she told him the whole story. She had remembered it almost verbatim because she, didn't, she, she just ruminated over it and she reviewed it and reviewed it and reviewed it and these she expected to him. That's why we normally use you, Luke to tell the story. Now next week I'm going to go over the Magi, but what's interesting about the four Gospels is that Matthew's the only one who talks about the Magi. Now let's say we interview Joseph and not Mary. What's Joseph leading with? The Magi. Why? Men and women process differently. What does mama normally do? My wife's sitting there looking at baby pictures from G last night. Right? Do men sit and look through baby pictures? No. Nope. Why not? We don't love our kids? No, we just don't process the same way. What would we look through if we did? Athletic photos, when we're out hunting, when we're out fishing, when we're out riding motorcycles, that stuff. We would not be looking through baby pictures. Isn't he so cute? No, you see that deer we shot? See that fish we caught? Remember when we did this? No, my dad did not sit around and look at my baby pictures and go, oh, isn't he cute? We were out doing something, shooting something, fishing for something, uh, all those things. So now we know, and you can read through Ephesus, and this will tell you, or when they were in Ephesus, that she could remember exactly what took place. Can you all remember every single nuance of every time you gave birth to your children? What did y'all have that Mary doesn't have? An drugs, yes. <laughs> Lots of drugs. Amen. Yep. Now, are y'all glad that you had kids in the 20th century? Yes. yes. And for some, 21st century. Yes. Why? Mary didn't have epidural. And then she had six more kids that we know of, no epidural. At least the next time she wasn't laying on a bale of hay. All right, so if we look at this, are these three events very important? Absolutely. And I haven't gone over the Magi. Why? Because that takes an entire service just to go over the Magi. Because they're so pitiful and so important to the story, and all the prophecy that surrounds them is also so important. But is it good that we do a step-by-step -step survey of what really took place that night, or what really took place that whole week? It's just like when we go over Easter. I don't cover Easter traditionally the way everybody else does. I go over the science behind it. Why? Because we have to stand before atheists and we have to tell people about Jesus. What's our number one job? Tell people about Christ. Do most people tell people about Jesus every single day? I do. Wow, when people find out I'm a pastor, it's like, pastor's here. But it's funny, every time I go somewhere, I've got atheists and Satanists who want to know about Jesus, but the people who go to church want to frown at me because of what I look like. It's always great when I go to a church, they always tell me I'm going to hell because I have long hair and I don't look like everybody else does. And then when I tell them I'm the preacher that day, it's amazing to hear what they say. Or when I go to Vistage. Vistage, I'm normally speaking to CEOs and they're like, uh, this guy doesn't look like a CEO, he looks like he's in a, in a rock band. No, that's what I do for a living. So when people ask you about this story, what do you know now? Ego Amy came down, took on our appearance on purpose, because he wanted to be one of us. He wanted to be just like us. He wanted to experience what we experienced so he could take care of us when he went back to heaven. So now if you say, I don't have anybody to talk to, is that a true statement? No. no. He understands what you're facing right now. He did cry when Lazarus died. Knowing full well that he was going to resurrect him in four days. But he's still upset because he loved him. He was his brother. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees tried to kill Lazarus. The naked boy 
In Luke 55, it's not the first time they tried to kill somebody to dispel the rumors of how great Jesus was. So our Creator comes with us. We know that there are spots and, and, and we know parts of the history between 0 to 30. We don't know a lot because it's irrelevant. Remember, Jesse Duplantis asked Paul why he never wrote about 12 to 30. It wasn't important. What's important? 30 33. Birth, 12. We get a glimpse into his life at 12, and we don't pick back up till 29 and a half. Why? Didn't re irrelevant. Is all of our lives, if we made a movie about our lives, would everything we ever did be important? No. When we read biographies, everything they did, is it in the book? No. Now, Nikki Six is the only guy I know that could be a drug addict on heroin and remember every single thing he ever did. I was a drug addict. I don't remember a whole lot of about 30 years. But Nikki Six is an amazing figure. Yeah, that's right. Mary could remember every single thing that took place at birth. Nobody asked her about the other six, right? There's Jesus. Why? The other six don't matter. Now, why don't we know anything about Joseph? <laughs> Do most men matter after the baby comes? They have a baby shower. Who's there? Women. They have a shower for marriage. Who's there? The women. Uh, when everybody comes to the hospital, who do they want to talk to? Mama. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, so uh, nah, we, we really don't matter. I try to tell you fathers, today's the last day you ever matter. Uh, when the grandparents come over, they're not going to talk to you. They're going to talk to the baby. We're coming to get the baby. And we're coming to take the baby, right? Yeah. There you go. There we go. Uh, so does he really matter? Absolutely. Why? Jesus was without sin. Now, James had an act to grind with Jesus, but eventually got over that when he got saved. But if you'll look at all the kids, they're all in a family ministry. Every single kid, two of which got books in the Bible, ended up being in the ministry. Did Joseph and Mary do a good job in raising them? Now, last week we went over why they were specifically chosen. Next week, I'm going to go over the actual net worth, be quiet, uh, of what Jesus was at the time of his death. Why is that so important? See, Joseph is part of that story. Because Joseph was big man on campus at the time, and so was Mary. And so the two cool kids got married and had a baby. And they were well off for the rest of their lives, but they had a job to do. Now, let's look at us. Do we really understand the job that we have before us? The answer is no. Look how many empty seats we have here today. Church is convenience. Is church really supposed to be a convenience? No. Why? We're in end times. He could come back any day now. As soon as the last year's heard, he's coming back. And he does not know today, but he has specifically told pastors, it's any day now. It's any day now. We still act like we got all the time in the world, don't we? Are there people that are going to die today and go to hell because we didn't take time to tell them? And not talk about this story, right? Why do we sit and act like everybody out there has time and we, we've got time too? I don't go one day without telling somebody about Christ. Or praying with somebody at the grocery store or at a restaurant. Why? I know the days are close and I know what my job is. What's our job again? Mark 16, 15 through 20. Heal the sick, cast out devils, preach the gospel. That's our three jobs. Now we do it through our professions. People always talk about purpose. You got one purpose. Write this down. This is your one purpose. Ephesians 5, 18. To know the Holy Spirit. That is the only time God talks about purpose in the entire 66 books of the Bible. To know the Holy Spirit. Why? You can't do any of the signs and wonders and miracles without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus couldn't do them either. That's why he had that Holy Spirit. As soon as he got baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him. Not the same. Two events that happened simultaneously. Just because we get baptized doesn't mean anything. That's just symbolic. It's washing us clean symbolically. But the Holy Spirit changes our life and gives us power. He couldn't do one miracle without the Holy Spirit. But now that we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we can do all the miracles. Why don't we? We're winding up Christmas. What am I going to get on you guys about January? Same thing every year, right? It's time to step up. It's time to change. Everybody tells me they want a different life, but all they do is the same thing they did the previous year. How can we change this world right now? Our, our country is burning down to the ground. Whose fault is it? Look in the mirror. It's the church. The ecclesia is not doing their job. Anytime you want to blame somebody, blame the church. That's us. 
I'm not talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the people. We don't do our job because we don't read this and we don't understand this. Because we have Christmas to have Easter. We didn't have Christmas to get presents. We didn't do it for reindeer. We didn't do it for Santa Claus. We didn't do it for Rudolph. We did it for Easter. Then we did it for Pentecost because Easter ain't good without Pentecost. Because he had to fulfill every single marker that was prophesied by Daniel and by Isaiah. And all, every box has to be checked. But we still act like this has nothing connected to anything. Because what's going to happen the first Sunday in January? Everybody's going to be taking down their tree. We won't. We paid enough for it. We're going to leave it up till May. And it's brand new and it's pretty and we both like Christmas lights. But we normally forget this took place. We've got everything down and then we go on with life. Do we want to be the 1% or 99 when it comes to, to actually relating to Jesus? Or to, when I remind you of that, if you're wondering, I used to be a high school coach, so I still preach that way. Uh, I didn't like losing, and Jesus never lost. So we're going to approach it the same way. So when I remind you of what you just said, you're not going to get mad at me, right? We probably will. Yeah, you're going to get mad at me. Act like you never said it. Act like you got amnesia and it never happened, right? Kind of like being married. I never said that. But is this important? How many people are you guys going to tell all the fill in the gaps this week about Jesus? Is this important to know if you're witnessing to an atheist? Yes. I got a few to talk to this week. I got breakfast with believers in the morning, which is going to be exciting because we have a believer that we're meeting with from West Africa. You talk about people that have seen signs, miracles, and wonders. Because you talk about people that lived on hell on earth. Those people have done it. Uh, so it's, it's going to be exciting to meet with her. Uh, she was a model in West Africa who's Holy Ghost filled and ready to tell the world about Jesus. So uh, her husband's actually a friend of ours, so we're going to meet with him. So everybody's clear on this. So next week we're going over the Magi. If you're smart, you'll read up on the Magi this week before I get back next week to talk about it. Because the Magi are so important. Daniel got it right. Is it true that you can prophesy something 800 years in advance and then it comes true? Yes. Is what was prophesied in the Old Testament coming true now? Yes. Is what Jesus talked about coming true now? Yes. When will you return? Rumors of wars. It goes through the whole list, and I've gone over the scripture multiple times. Read Matthew if you want to hear that. Uh, but he told us when he was coming, every single box has been checked. This could be our last Christmas here. What would happen if the ecclesia got together and prayed and fasted and went out and told people about Jesus? It could be our last one. They predicted that our generation will be the last one to see death. I'm in. Who here is ready to go to heaven with me? I'm in. No more worry, no more doubt, no more fear. Nothing but greatness, man. We get to be with Jesus every single day. I'm in. I'm excited about that. I don't have to drive in traffic anymore, especially in Atlanta or L.A. I'm in. I don't ever have to go back to D.C. and worry about potholes in the middle of the road. <laughs> Judith never has to go back and be cold in Boston. <laughs> she gets to go to Jamaica and stay there. None of us have to go through all the things that we despise because we're with the Father. But are we willing to do what it takes now to get there? Now remember, your job performance here will depend what you do there. You want to smock? Or robe. You want to be in a management position or you want to be one of the rank and file employees? Which one do you want to do? I want a management position. I want, I want to supervise like Hawaii. Give me Hawaii. <laughs> or I like San Diego. To me, that's like what heaven's going to be like. Or uh, Fiji. I'll take Fiji. Nice place. Or no, no. Avignon, France. My favorite place on the planet. Avignon, France. Great baguettes. Really nice folks. All right, so everybody gets this, right? So when I quiz you guys, uh, if you're at home, I actually gave a pop quiz one time because I was tired of people not reading their Bible and almost everybody failed. The people who got it right were the women. All the men failed. No pressure on the men here, right? So if I gave you a pop quiz on this a month from now, would you remember it? So everybody understand why this is so important? See, we got kids... I read a statistic. I used to be a teacher. 
a guy said that he's given out more F's, written up more kids in his 30-year career this year than he's ever done it. I made it 24 years. I watched the slide from when I started in 1990 to when I left. That was just in, insane on how far it went down. Now, I've also watched the slide in the church. We sing a lot. We feel great. We wear skinny jeans. We use smoke machines. And we don't learn one thing about the gospel. When are we going to change that? we got a former Georgia football player in here today. Did y'all ever talk about winning? Yeah. How did you like two days in the, in the summer? It's terrible. Especially you weigh what? 300 plus, right? Okay. Even at my weight when I played soccer, I weighed 165 pounds and I had four or five speed. Now it takes four and a half seconds to get out of the chair. But I'm also almost 60. So why do we do two a days? So we can win. Everybody else is doing two a days. Why don't we practice every single time we get a chance? Why do we watch film? Why don't we do all these things? Because we want to win. We don't understand we, we're supposed to win at this too. We take this as a secondary profession that we do when we have our spare time. No, God expects, God's what? Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things shall be added, not third, fourth, fifth, or when you have time. Right now is the time to do this. You're either in or you're out. Now, are you in or out? So you're not doing this to make me happy. You're doing this to who to make happy. Yeah, because next time you go ask him for something, he's going to ask you a question. You in or out? It's kind of like being sort of married. Warren, are you sort of married? No. I know she's not sort of married, and if you went home and told her you were sort of married, well, there'd be a problem tonight. Right. Kelly, is Bill sort of married, or is he married? Oh, he's married. Shannon, is, is Brandon married? He's sitting back there with his face covered. Uh, baby, am I sort of married, or am I I'm, I'm absolutely married. She said I was absolutely married. So I'm absolutely in. Because I, I, when, when you get this, you get this, man. And you're ready to go. Jesus never lost a battle. He's not going to. And now, will he cut you? Yeah, the joy of high school athletics and college and pros is you can cut people. Can you cut people from church? I do, but a lot of pastors don't. I'm the guy who fire, fires volunteers. Yeah, I used to do celebrity golf tournaments, and I went through one day and fired like 12 people that were volunteers. So they're like, we're working for free. Good. Then no hard feelings. Get out. I would rather be hard on you than Jesus tell you to get out. The tears he's going to cry are not yours. It's his. When he talks about tears and gnashing of teeth, that's his. He doesn't want any of his kids not to be with him. How would you guys feel if something happened to one of yours? It's difficult. Faced it. Way more difficult. So imagine losing two billion of your children and they can't spend eternity with you. And you lost them because the people that you gave the job to didn't do the job. Now, remember, he will fire you. He will give that job to somebody else. Like, if I didn't take this job, he would have found someone else to do it. But it would have been with me the rest of my life that I knew my job. I watch film. I read the playbook. I analyze the film. I analyze the enemy. And I'm ready on Sundays to win the ball game. I approach this just like I did when I was a coach. And then I run through every single nuance and scenario that Lucifer's going to throw at me on Sunday so I'm ready to play. Are y'all? Because tomorrow Monday morning, he's going to throw something at you you didn't expect, and he's probably going to start a fight between spouses. Everybody have a button we like to have push? Or am I the only person who could get mad at my spouse? Yeah, right? Now, I know you guys don't argue at all. Perfect marriage. And y'all work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't either. But we do work together. We are married together, and she helps me with the church. Do you think that Lucifer could find a little loophole in there to make us mad at each other? Yeah. So we take every weapon he has away from him, and then we focus on who? Ego Amy. I am. Now you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that God gave up all his rights and privileges, became one of us, so we could carbon copy what he did. So now you know you have no excuse for not accomplishing greatness, miracles, signs, and wonders, because he did it the same way y'all have to do it. There was no exception. All right, everybody stand up, and we'll bless it, and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and go. If you're at home, go ahead and stand up, do prayer with us. Also, this is our offering time. Uh, if you want to do an offering with us or be, give a gift to our church, it's EncounterChrist.org. 
uh, go over, go to give and go down. It can be uh, reoccurring or it can be just one time. We appreciate everything that you do with our church. Thank you so much for viewing today. All right, every head bowed, every eye uh, closed. Yes, I'll pray for that after we close. All right, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for coming to earth to relieve us of all the sin and get us to heaven. Thank you for giving us your blood. Thank you for going from Christmas to Easter to Pentecost. All three are equally important because without the three of them, nothing happens. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for living for us. Thank you for giving us the examples you did. And thank you for giving us so many miracle signs and wonders that they could not contain them in all the books that were ever written. Lord, we thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here, being with us. Holy Spirit, thank you for going out from this service and convicting people about your love and your grace and getting them here next Sunday and receiving the blessing of knowing who Jesus is as Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next week. Go ahead and go to our website, EncounterChrist.org. If you have not seen all the other services with this, you're going to want to see them. I did uh, Mary and Joseph, Why God Picked Them. You're going to want to see that one. You don't want to miss the Magi, and you don't want to miss the entire series. All right, so thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I'll see you next week.